And with this, we are moving on to the next session. Uh, no, let me say that I have great pleasure in welcoming uh, three people from Delhi. Mr. R. Prasannan is here. I've seen him, but uh, Mr. Prasannan, good morning. Nice good to morning. see you. And uh, thank Hello. you for sparing time to be here. Uh, Nitin Gokhale is here. Good morning, Nitin. So thank you so much for sparing time and coming here. Pleasure. Pleasure. To join us. Uh, good morning, Shastri Ramachandran. Thank so thank you thank for you. sparing time and being yeah. here. I know all of you are busy. Huh. Huh. Uh, and of course, good morning, Mr. Satyamurthy. Very nice good to have morning. you here. So we have three people from Delhi and Mr. Satyamurthy from the outskirts of Chennai. So thank you for sparing time. And, uh, so for those who, uh, of you who would like to know a little more about Mr. Chengapa, who's going to moderate this program. Chengapa is an associate professor at Christ University in Bangalore and teaches international relations along with strategic studies. He was editorial writer with the Deccan Herald Bangalore and specialized on national security issues and international affairs for six and a half years. He's also worked as a senior research fellow with the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi. He was special correspondent with the Indian Express in New Delhi, where he reported exclusively on military matters and national security issues. He's also worked with the Hindu business line in Bangalore, where he's covered uh, similar subjects. He holds a doctorate in, uh, in Indian foreign policy towards China in the post-Nehruvian period and a master's in defense and strategic studies from Madras University. He's also an author of two books, India-China Relations Post-Conflict Phase to Post-Cold War Period and Pakistan, Army, Islam, and Foreign Policy. And besides a research monograph called Pakistan's Fifth Estate, the, the Inter-Services Directorate. So thank you, Chengapa, uh, for being here. Uh, I'll pass this on to you, and we look forward to a stimulating discussion with a heavyweight panel. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Shashi. Uh, it is my uh, task to introduce the uh, eminent journalist I'll begin first with uh, my good friend Radhakrishnan Prasannan, who is a postgraduate in Defense Studies and has been a journalist for the last 36 years. He has been writing on defense and national security besides foreign policy, politics, law, constitutional affairs, science and current affairs for the week and Malayalam Manorama newspaper for the last 30 years from New Delhi. He has traveled widely around the world reporting from conflict zones, the Kargil War in 1999, the Siachen conflict, Afghanistan during the anti-Taliban war following 9-11, the anti-Taliban war in Pakistan's Swat Valley and in Tibet. He has also traveled extensively through Russia during the post-Soviet political strife, through the Maldives during the constitution-making period, through Pakistan during the several elections in that country, covered major diplomatic events like the nuclear security summit in Seoul, South Korea, the nuclear deal in Washington, several Commonwealth, non-aligned and BRICS summits in various world capitals. He has traveled through Tibet as also other regions of China for news reporting as also for media interactions. Prasannan is currently posted as the chief of the week New Delhi Bureau and also writes a popular column in the week magazine called the PMO Beat. Welcome Prasannan. The next speaker is uh, another gentleman, Nitin Gokhale who's a media entrepreneur, strategic affairs analyst, and author of more than half a dozen books on military history, insurgencies, and war. One of South Asia's leading strategic analysts, Gokhale started his career in journalism in 1983. Over the past 36 years, he has led teams of journalists across print, broadcast, and web, web platforms. A specialist in conflict coverage, Gokhale has lived and reported from India's Northeast for 23 years been on the ground at Kargil in the summer of 1999 and also brought us live reports from Sri Lanka's Elam War 4 between 2006-2009. An alumni of the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in Hawaii, Gokhale now writes lec lectures and analyzes security and strategic matters in Indo-Pacific and travels regularly to China, Europe, South and Southeast Asia to take part in various seminars and conferences. Gokhale is also a popular visiting faculty at the India's Defense Services Staff College, the three military war colleges, India's National Defense College, College of Defense Management, and the Intelligence Bureau's uh, Intelligence Training School. 
He now owns and runs two important portals, BharatShakti.in and StratNewsGlobal.com. Welcome, uh, Nitin. Then we have a very distinguished uh, senior journalist, Shastri Ramachandran, who is an author, independent journalist, editor, writer, columnist, and editorial publications consultant, working for media in India, China, and Europe for over 30 years. He is an editorial consultant beyond Global Affairs television channel, New Delhi, senior editorial consultant, international press syndicate, and member editorial board IDN In-Depth News Berlin and contributing editor, The Citizen New Delhi. He was consulting editor, Indian Council of World Affairs, New Delhi, between 2017 and 18. He was senior consultant and founding editor of China India Dialogue, published by China International Publishing Group in Beijing. Publications he worked with includes The Times of India, The Tribune and Indian Express in India, China Daily, Global Times and founder editor of China India Dialogue in Beijing. The author of books, monographs, papers and thousands of articles. Uh, Shastri is co-editor of the book State of Nepal, co-editor, co-author of Media, Conflict and Peace and the monograph Human Rights of Agricultural Laborers in Tamil Nadu. He was head center, time center for media studies and has lectured on writing, editing and publishing at journalism schools in India and Europe. Lastly, uh, we have Mr. Satya Murthy, veteran journalist, political and foreign policy analyst. Uh, Mr. Satya Murthy has been the head Chennai initiative of the Observer Research Foundation and multidisciplinary Indian public policy think tank headquartered in New Delhi since the former's establishment in December 2002. Concurrently, a student of Indian politics and foreign policy, he is a student of India, Maldives, Sri Lanka and the shared Indian Ocean neighborhood with particular reference to their domestic politics, bilateral and trilateral relations and interdependent dynamics. He has written extensively on these and related subjects and authored books on these and other subjects and also participated in national and international seminars and contributed chapters and papers. Welcome everybody on board. So I think without further ado, we can ask uh, Mr. Prasannan to make his uh, presentation. Let me make uh, one thing very clear. I'm no expert on misinformation or disinformation. As journalists, we are not supposed to be indulging in either of it. So most of the time we are accused of these two crimes. I would say instead of being accused, we should be view, viewed as the victims of misinformation and disinformation. It's we who are often misinformed and even disinformed by the state or its agencies, by business interests, by organizations, by NGOs, by virtually everyone who has a lie to tell. We may at times be carrying or propagating a, that lie, believing it to be the truth. But believe me, we rarely generate that lie. Anyway, let's not dwell further on it because I know I'll get into trouble here. We are not dealing with media ethics in this conference. The conference, as we know, is about China and this session is about media landscape in China. As I said earlier, anyone who has a lie to sell or tell may use the media to sell it. The state and its agencies, business houses, institutions, NGOs, civil society groups, lawyers, criminals, or anyone who has a lie to sell. All states and their agencies have lies to tell, and they tell those through the media, sometimes effectively, sometimes ineffectively, and at times they get caught. And very often they get caught. I won't spare any state or agency from this thing. All states indulge in it, India, China, Pakistan, the United States, Russia, UK, France, or anybody, anybody any country in the world. And most of the time they claim that they are doing it in their supreme national interest. So my point is, you can't judge a state by the lies it tells, since all st states tell lies. Then how can we judge, sit in judgment over disinformation since of China or Pakistan or any state? Here, I think there is another factor that ought to be taken into account while judging the conduct of a state. How accountable are those regimes or those states to their own people? 
we india is an open liberal democracy at least we claim so theoretically so constitutionally so though in practice many people may disagree with that but i am talking of the constitutional scheme of things our regime is supposed to be accountable to the people the regime is questioned or supposed to be questioned every day in parliament and held accountable the regime is also questioned or supposed to be questioned in the media and other public fora criticized analyzed held accountable it is through these accountability processes that we achieve the golden mean between what is required to be held under wraps and what ought to be told to the public it is this accountability that characterizes the nature of a state system this accountability is absent in totalitarian regimes in communist regimes like china the accountability of the regime is not to the public but to the party the party can analyze question and hold the regime accountable but the accountability of the party to the public at large is absent or vague or opaque though now that we have established as to who are the angels and who are the devils in this business of information business misinformation and disinformation let's see how china is indulging in these and how effective or ineffective they are the fact is that the communist regime of china hides more than what they reveal according to dan blumenthal writing in an american enterprise institute paper recently there are nine agencies of china that are involved in media censorship or media control one i'll just list them the general administration of press and publication they draft the laws and the regulations and enforce them state administration of radio film and television that's the second one it controls the content on radio film and tv that i read in china three the ministry of information industry it regulates their telecommunication software industries internet related services four the state council information office scio which promotes china's chinese media to a global audience and is responsible for restricting news that is posted on the internet we outsiders often come across them the central propaganda department which is a communist party organ that works with uh, the other organizations the ministry of public security that's the sixth one whose job is to monitor and filter the internet and punish those who speak out seven the general administration for customs that confiscates and bans books videos and other information that china does not want within its borders the eighth state secrecy bureau that enforces state secrecy laws which are often used to punish individuals who write undesirable content and ninth the last judiciary which ultimately convicts and hands out sentences for uh, those arrested on censorship related charges now these are the agencies or institutions that are engaged in controlling information and its dissemination within china i guess here here we are not much concerned about censorship within china or the media control within china that's something the chinese people have to bother about and if they are happy with the kind of media they are getting so be it we are not concerned what we are concerned here is the information misinformation or disinformation directed towards or against the outside world especially india which is in a particularly competitive or a, even a combative combative relationship with china i won't venture much into how the chinese regime pursues misinformation or disinformation in the realm of military security because there are people who are better qualified than i am to speak about military propaganda i would rather look at information warfare indulged through public media as also the tools and strategies adopted by china you would all agree that the role of the traditional media that is news agencies newspapers and television The, their role is getting diminished in this world especially after the social media revolution of uh, twitter instagram telegram whatsapp and what not all the same news i mean authenticated information which the state and the citizen relies upon rely upon is still supplied mostly by news agencies the rest of it is information news is different ever since china embarked on a mission to rise as a superpower beijing has been investing hugely into media with the express purpose of expanding the size and reach of their media and also to influence world opinion through projects of the chinese point of view 
This has been more so after the rise of Xi Jinping, who has been pursuing a more aggressive foreign policy than his predecessors. And let's not forget, Xi had spent 15 years in the propaganda wing of the Communist Party. He makes no qualms about controlling or managing the media. In fact, in February 2016, on a tour of the Chinese media outlets, he, Xi Jinping had reminded them, I quote, all the work done by the party's media must reflect the party's will, safeguard the party's authority, and safeguard the party's unity, I unquote. Beijing is matching their words with their money. I don't know how many of us have realized that this. I'm sure this panel would know, but the rest of them. That the world's largest news agency today is not the Reuters, not the Associated Press, not the AFP, but the Xinhua. It's larger than the Reuters, Associated Press, AFP, TAS, Al Jazeera, or any other. It delivers news across the world in eight languages. Chinese, English, Spanish, French, Russian, Portuguese, Arabic, and Japanese. As also news pictures. It has entered into contracts for exchanging news and news pictures with more than 80 foreign news agencies. Xinhua is also responsible for handling and in some cases censoring reports from the foreign media destined for release in China. You can imagine its financial clout from the fact that it acquired commercial real estate on New York Times Square while where it is developing its English language reporting staff. Sinhua is also has also started an English language satellite news network. Then there is a Chinese Radio International. Today is one of the world's largest radio networks with services in 63 languages, including Hindi, Tamil, and several other Indian languages. They have announcers or Chinese born and jockeys who speak excellent Hindi, Tamil, Bengali, Malayalam, and several other languages. Their foreign broad language broadcasts are still largely about songs, stories, and projection of soft culture. But the news agency is being employed mainly to project information and disinformation about China. And they make no qualms about it. I can go on thus, listing the institutional mechanisms. There are several more that China has employed for the purpose of dominating the world of news and information. And also to project views favoring Chinese interests across the world. Social media experts and data analysts, they had a session just now before us, uh, would tell you a hundred more ways and means through which the Chinese are indulging in controlling and manipulating information. In fact, Sarah Kok, who is another uh, researcher with the Freedom House in, for China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, she has listed several instances of uh, disinformation indulged in by the Chinese Communist Party. This spread, quote, her quote, proven falsehoods so societal discord and panic manipulate perceptions of public opinion or undermine democratic process, unquote. In short, as a colleague of mine put it recently, Beijing wants the Chinese whispers, muttered, Chinese whispers to resonate across the world, all over the world. But now I'll come to the crux of the question. Is it working? Are Chinese whispers actually resonating across the world? Let's take two instances. One, how China tried to sell their story or their lies or half-truths, if they are, during the coronavirus outbreak. And two, how they tried to sell their side of the story during the military standoff that we are having now with uh, China or during that dog club crisis. Now, let's get back to Sarah Cook, I mean, the Freedom House expert. She says since March, coordinated, quote, coordinated and covert attempts by China-linked actors to manipulate information, particularly regarding COVID-19, have been detected in countries including the United States, Argentina, Italy, Serbia, and Taiwan, with relevant content often delivered in local languages, she unquotes. And she lists numerous instances of how China is using the social media to manipulate information. And in the end, she says, quote again, if the Chinese Communist Party invests heavily in this new approach to international influence. It will pose an enormous challenge to democratic governments, technology firms, and internet users. That's her quote, unquote. Agreed. But my question is, have they, have they been able to convince the world? I think the jury is still out on this. Despite all the ranting and raging, 
that the Chinese leadership is doing. The needle of suspicion over the source of the coronavirus is still pointed towards China. Don't think I'm subscribing to it. I'm saying the perception still is. Which means with all the information, misinformation and disinformation machinery that is allegedly at their disposal, they are not being able to convince the world of their side of the corona story. Now let's take the military crisis that we are facing with the Chinese in Ladakh. The Chinese, I'm told, are on a Saiwar effort using strong media messaging. They have shown TV footage of the swift mobilization of their troops by air and by train from Hubei province to the Indian borders in, ma in a matter of hours. That claim was aired across the me world media and perhaps a lot of people believed it. Yes, see, I, there have been several such. I'm just instance, giving one or two instances. And I'm sure most of you are aware of the cyber cyber rattling that the Chinese are indulging in to overawe the Indian military. But the point is that none of these attempts are, is cutting any, any Himalayan eyes with the target audience or with the target viewers. The target audience and target viewers must be the Indian military leadership and the Indian public. Most of the Indian public miss these so-called footages and those in the profession of national security who watch those are hardly convinced. They know there is the Indian military leadership, know how vulnerable the Tibetan railway or the, or the road system are to an aerial Indian aerial attack. Our troops, they know, are already acclimatized at higher altitudes, unlike the Chinese troops who are just arrived by train and by air. Yes, our generals might have failed in projecting that given the secretive nature of our own establishment. But the point is that the Chinese have failed to in misinform or disinform us, if that is what they were intending. And this failure has led to a kind of frustration among them. This frustration is evident in the political behavior of the Chinese leadership, as also of their media. During the dog club crisis, you may remember, yes. and also during the current uh, crisis in Galwan, in Galwan and Pangong Lake, the Chinese foreign office and their media have been ranting and raging, which is not characteristic of their normal political behavior. Usually they are very restrained. And now we found them ranting and raging against us. They have been, they have been on the TV, on the net, in newspaper pages, making accusations, allegations, and raising charges of aggression against India. And whereas India, we have been, both our official establishment and our media, have been fairly restrained and quiet. This ranting and raging on the China's part is nothing but manifestation of a frustration rather than any sort of injured innocence being uh, 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 articulated. What I am trying to put across is simply this, that though China has been attempting to dominate the world of information, they are finding that their attempts are not just working. With all their media clout and deep pockets, they are not able to sell the lies or half-truths, if they are, that they are proffering through the various media channels at their command. How much of pro-Beijing news have we seen in our newspapers or television channels or net news portals or social media, even after the virus outbreak or even during the Ladakh standoff? I would say negligible. So in my humble point of view, the Chinese are still like Don Quixotes, tilting at the windmill of global information. This inability or failure of theirs is leading to that frustration which I talked about earlier. They just can't fathom why or how the world is continuing to rebuff them despite their economic power, technological prowess, or military strength. The frustration is in their complete inability despite having made huge institutional investments to penetrate, influence, and control the news and information world in the manner that the West has been doing with their Reuters, AP, AFP, CNN, BBC, and all other media networks. In other words, they realize that the Chinese whispers are not working on India or most of the free world. I personally experienced this frustration of the Chinese media controllers about this. I've been invited twice, once as a part of a team of journalists to take part in media dialogues with Chinese counterparts. Representatives from Xinhua, Red Chinese Radio, and all prominent uh, news organizations of China were there in these discussions. I could fathom this frustration in the manner in which they were arguing their point of view. 
they realize that they are not able to put their point of view to the Indian people, to the Indian establishment, to the Indian policy makers, to the Indian political actors. They just can't understand why the Indian media publishes negative news stories about China. They can't understand why Indian media does not subscribe to their point of view. They don't understand how the Indian government allows stories of excesses in Tibet, real or imagined, to be published in the Indian media when their president or PM is visiting India. The one refrain I heard everywhere was that the media should project good news about each other. I felt like telling them, go and take a long walk along the Great Wall. The simple point is, as Tara Karta, a former director of the National Security Council Secretariat, recently wrote in an article, I quote, China has little idea of how this boisterous democracy of India works. We, we are enraged rather than convinced by their threats and claims. Their information war, therefore, is hindered by a lack of cultural understanding or political understanding and not by technology. Technology they have at their disposal. It's a lack of understanding of a democratic culture that they have. There is also another reason for this frustration. As you all know, they have blocked various channels of information within China that the rest of the world uses. I'm talking of Google, WhatsApp, Telegram, Instagram, all these Twitter. By banning and blocking these, the Chinese leadership has also denied to themselves the use of these powerful tools that they could have used to transmit information or disinformation or propaganda. Yes. They have their WeChats and uh, their own alternate uh, forums, I mean, uh, portals uh, which, or, or tools of social media. But that's not popular with the rest of the world. So in other words, they are on different platforms altogether and they are not able to reach out also. They realize that control of the social media platforms has actually boomeranged on them. I'm not saying the situation would remain so in the days to come. With their mastery over the cyber world, their technological prowess, their deep pockets, and their long-term view of political, political strategic future, which we often don't have. I'm sure China would come out with newer tools and means of controlling and manipulating news and information. And, but then how do we engage and control and confront that threat? I have no idea. We need to find solutions for this. But I'm just giving you the situation as of now. When that threat comes, I'm sure there are better people than I. There are cyber experts who know better than I, who are working on this. I think I won't try to prescribe solutions to, uh, to uh, issues which I don't know, because I have no expertise in the cyber world. I'm just a news man, a news consumer. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you for your patience. And uh, as I told you, I have to scoot now because the judgment is all, already the TV screen is showing that certain scrolls on the judgment on the Babri budget uh, verdict. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patience and good day to all of you. That was a very incisive and insightful and interesting uh, presentation. Thanks one, once again. Yeah. Good morning, friends. I'm very happy to be with all of you, my colleagues and uh, friends with whom I have interacted before, including Commodore uh, Seshadri, I see. I'm very happy to see you again. And I had, you know, this question of, I'm not going to, I'm not a warrior of any kind, you know. Today, India and Indian media is full of warriors. We have Corona warriors, Pakistan warriors, China warriors. The media is full of these people. I am not an expert on anything. I am not a warrior for anything. I consider my job to be a detached observer and write dispassionately without taking sides. You know, when I joined the profession, we had a great editor-in-chief called S. Malgaoka of the Indian Express, who happened to come to Chennai when I was a reporter. And so I had written a report and put it in the tray. He just took it, he tossed it back at me. It was a Sunday, he was sitting in the chief reporter's chair. He said, well, this report won't go. I said, uh, Mr. Malgaoka, why? He said, no, whatever you have written as the intro, the lead of your story, please write the opposite of that and see. If that makes news, then this does not make news. So whatever you say, you have to weigh it against a contra statement to see if that is what makes news. This is the test that I learned. I have worked in China for uh, 
at different times with different publications. I can say perhaps that I have dealt with almost all Chinese media organizations and worked with uh, two of the leading ones, especially China Daily and Global Times, the English Global Times. I also had the uh, honor and uh, wonderful experience of launching the China India Dialogue, which is perhaps the only such bilateral magazine, which is independent of the governments. Doubtless, it is run, brought out by a state publication, publishing organization like the China International Group. But it is not like the other one, which is brought out by the India-China Economic Council. It is not attached to any institution in that sense. And I had a number of distinguished Indian diplomats, scholars, economists writing for that because the focus of that magazine was because people always ask me, how did you work for a Chinese magazine? How did you start for them? The basic premise on which I brought it out month after month was that India and China have a lot of differences, a lot of bilateral differences. And some of them are very uh, tense issues and which can be the source of conflict. So, But we will deal with issues where the two countries have a common interest. We'll confine ourselves to that. This was both a strategic necessity and perhaps the only way the journal could have been brought out month after month without any conflict with either part. And the, one of the first persons to write an essay for that was the Indian ambassador in Beijing and the Chinese ambassador in Delhi. So I, in my experience, there is a lot of space in the Chinese media. It's a question of how you choose to occupy that space and what is the messaging that you are looking at. When I was in China and I wrote from there, one of the responses I got was from the late Mr. Gautam Adhikari, who was my editor in the Times of India. And he was also editor-in-chief of DNA, where I was writing a column later. He said writing about China in the Indian media is a kind of social service. Of course, it was not a social service. I think I was paid very, very well for what I was do doing there, but not. I was writing for the Indian media, for the Times of India, for the DNA, for many media here and elsewhere. He said, because so little is known about China in India. We have a lot of talk about China when there is a conflict situation like we have now. So I will confine myself to this situation so that I don't run out of time. And I will illustrate with two examples of how India or we in India read the Chinese media and whether it is adequate for our reading. First and foremost, uh, I find that there is a clear binary, you know, it's, everything is black and white. It is like this Ramayana. You have Rama who is good and noble and this thing. And you, then you have Ravana who is the repository of all evil. is a black Madrasi also, you know, unlike the fair, you know, Thakurs of the North. But I being from Ravana country, I being a Madrasi myself, I also can appreciate the virtues and attributes of Ravana. I mean, he was a musician, he was a mathematician, he was an astronomer, he was a scholar. He had 10 heads and that is what he required for his wisdom. You know, Rama was a valiant, he was a Mariada Purush. So it is more a one dimensional image of Rama. So I feel that the India-China situation is also somewhat like that. China, when I when you look at China, it's a hydra headed entity. But we in India, we see it only in one way as something to be divinized and so on. So in most of my when you look at the situation, the first question I have been asking myself from the day this broke out is why has no one in I'll have to speak also about Indian media because anything I speak about Chinese media will need to have a context, a reference, and a mirror to our media. Otherwise, we will not understand it in context. Is Till today, the Prime Minister has maintained an enigmatic silence on the Chinese incursions. There is not one media has consistently asked him or hammered the point, saying that, why are you not speaking out on this? And this question has never been asked at any of the briefings of the MEA or the Defense Minister or any of the spokesmen so far. And the media comes up with its own explanation. Now, surprisingly, the Chinese media also has not commented on this. They are guided only by what the Indian state or the government or its agencies does. They don't lend much credence to Indian media. For me, the important 
marker is that Chinese media is all on in the hands of the establishment. When I say the establishment, there are nuances and differences. You have state media, you have party media, and you have government media. One can say a majority of the media are state media. Then you have party media. The party media, the leading party media is the people's thing. And the largest selling newspaper is the Global Times, not the Global Times which we see in English, but the Global Times in Chinese, which I don't think anybody in India reads. They read the English version of the Global Times, which is what gives us our idea of China. But long before Global Times, there has been the China Daily from 1983, and it is not so well known. And I have spelled out in greater detail a paper which I had done for our friend Mr. Commodore Seshadri's institution on Chinese media and institution, how they work and so on. It is supposed to be part of a book which is in the process. So I will not go into great detail on how this media works or how their institutions are primed for achieving their state targets or the party targets or political objectives. But I find that in India, we are quite often unable to make the distinction or see the nuance between what the government media is saying, what the party media is saying, what the PLA newspaper is saying, and what the Chinese Global Times is saying, and what the English Global Times is saying. The English Global Times, as I keep saying at every occasion that I have such interactions, is the Chinese equivalent of Fox News. Please let me be very clear about that. It's a very small circulation newspaper, mainly for the expats in the diplomatic community. And its shrill hawkish tone from day one was calculated, was a calculated marketing strategy which has paid off handsomely. I do not know of any other newspaper which in less than 10 years has been so successful and so widely quoted all over in India by every Indian newspaper as the global type. Which makes me wonder how many people read the China Daily which has more nuanced, balanced, and toned down commentary on the situation in India. And nine out of 10 times, I have found that you can go to the Global, global Times Chinese site also, and there is some toggling you can do and read the English version. Two people do that. They read only the English version of the Global Times. Second thing, one expects the Chinese media to articulate, to bat, and to propagate and keep hammering the viewpoint of the Chinese state, of the Chinese Communist Party, of the Chinese government, and all Chinese arms of the state and its agencies. This is to be expected. But why is the Indian media doing the same thing? This is my question. I have not found a single note of difference or divergence in the Indian media when it comes to this conflict with China. In fact, I find even racist undertones in the language that is used in the English media in India. And there are a number of things which does not, I'm not interested in a demonized jingoistic view of China. I want to understand what is happening in China. If you read the Indian media, you do not get an understanding of China at all. And the Chinese media is not obsessed with India. I would definitely request either the Press Institute or the Center for uh, the Commodore Seshadri Center, to take any one month and look at how much space India occupies in Chinese media and how much space China occupies in Indian media. Purely as an experimental proposition, I think you will be surprised at your findings. Now, the two instances that I want to speak about, one relates to India's campaign, very high wire campaign for a membership of the nuclear suppliers group, during which time I was in China. And this was 2015-16, after launching the thing. And when this campaign was there, first and foremost, when I looked, I luckily I happened to be in Beijing, so I was not kind of snowed under this avalanche of propaganda for the Indian government, you know, which one finds in the Indian media. So I could see what is happening. The whole issue was being treated as a two bilaterals that India is conducting, one between India and the US, and the other between India and China. That US has told us, OK, we have said we want to. Now you go to Beijing, talk to them, and you get them to get you inside. But membership of the NSG was not a bilateral issue at all. In fact, the NSG was primarily created by the US with a number of countries that would do the US bidding specifically 
to keep India from getting any nuclear supplies. And this is a point which we should have emphatically reminded our readers about, but it was not done as much as it should have been done. But whatever that may be, I'm not going into the question of whether India needs the membership of the NSG. It can do without it. Those are not issues on which I'm competent to comment at all, because perhaps I would say we didn't need it as badly as we did. But there were a number of reports in the Chinese media day after day in Global Times, in uh, China Daily, on uh, Xinhua Net, and uh, at that time it was CCTV and CCTV News, which said that no purpose will be served by the Indian Prime Minister going to Tashkent to meet President Xi Jinping. You know, there was a conference of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, there was a summit. And it was put out that Prime Minister Narendra Modi will go and meet President Xi, and that will be it, and there will be a breakthrough. And we had our Foreign Secretary, it was Dr. Jai Shankar, who is now the Foreign Minister, who had gone to Beijing, and he was outside the meeting venue in uh, Korea, where the NSG plenum was being held. And then the PM and I had also written, I said, we have to read the Chinese media, right? When the People's Daily, Xinhua Net, Global Times, China Daily, all of them are saying nothing is to be achieved. What is the message being sent to India? Mr. Indian Prime Minister, please don't come. Nothing will be achieved. Don't go in for this loss of face. That is one plausible reading, which is the reading I did. And I said, this mission is foredoomed. China will not allow this issue to be personalized by the prime minister meeting the president. They will not yield an inch of ground on this. They will only end up humiliating ourselves and losing face. And this is precisely what happened. So this is one instance where our reading of the Chinese media went horribly wrong. Although we are we uh, kind of believe ourselves to be so conversant in our understanding of the Chinese media. The second issue is now, again, I was going through the sequence of events that have happened, you know, leading up to the confrontation in Ladakh. And what I found was that I'm personally convinced that it is China which triggered the confrontation, that it is China which crossed the military line first. There is no doubt that it came from China, you know. And but that does not mean India was not confrontational or was not challenging in its own way. But the most important thing to me was that any observer with a grasp of the issue, we need to look at what has been happening in the years before this recently. One of the most important developments was the visit of US Ambassador Richard Varma to Tawang. There were a number of the Dalai Lama had gone earlier. Every time somebody goes, the Chinese will have a pro forma kind of objection or statement expressing their reservations and rejection of it. But till the US ambassador, Richard Verma, went there, they had never reiterated their claim of the whole of Arunachal being theirs. But after he went in 2016, the Chinese reiterated that. Not only they reiterated that, they also refer to the articles of the 2005 agreement, which is about the political parameters. And they, ref they explicitly use the term in one of the articles, saying that if we have to maintain peace and tranquility on the border, I think that should have rung alarm bells in India, that things are going to kind of sliding off track, you know, that sooner or later we are headed for a conflict. But I think there has been no reading of the Chinese media for the signals that they are saying. And we tend to read Chinese media and usually just qualify it by saying it is hawkish and things like that. And I find that we have very few Indian centers which we can turn to for genuine information from China. I look at only two of them. I look at uh, uh, Mr. Jayadeva Ranade's center for, you know, this. Uh, China analysis and uh, strategies. I find it to be the most outstanding. I may not agree with a lot of their positions or viewpoints, you know. Uh, I mean, I quite understand any institution, organization like this will necessarily take a hawkish position against China. We have to be hawkish when it comes to our national security.
but i find there is a lot of information they go and dig out from places where you don't find information in any other media the other institution which i find comes up with a broad spectrum you know of channels that bring us information about china is the institute of chinese studies headed by ambassador ashok kanta otherwise i find that many of us we mirror the chinese media in what we do in the kind of noise we raise about it that we go on battling against them so this does not help us to either understand chinese media or chinese intentions my reading of the chinese media is that we have to read it for intention i am not concerned with whether they are hawkish they, they will be hawkish why would they not be hawkish we expect them to be hawkish they would be still when it comes to india of course it would be so we don't need to read it why are they still why are they hawkish what is the message underlying this is this a rant or is this a warning is this a cautionary note because the chinese are extremely polite and courteous you know they will slice your neck without making a sound you will not know till the dripping blood falls on your toe that your throat has been but till then they are extremely polite we have to cut through this huge you know architecture of politeness you know which can stone wall you and then discover what are the dots that that we require to pick up and join and i think if indian strategic community especially the media does this they would be doing a great service to help understand china i think i would like to end with this one if i have done my time mr ramchandran that was a very interesting uh, presentation with two three case studies and really enlightening to one and all thank you once again nitin please go ahead okay uh, thank you shashi uh, thank you virinda uh, chengappa and all the other participants here uh, it's always a pleasure uh, the association with pii uh, and uh, of course uh, mr heblicker center uh, has been uh, there for some time and therefore uh, i had no hesitation in accepting the invitation uh, when it came although i was wondering whether it will clash with something else that i was planning fortunately it hasn't clashed and um, also i don't have a compulsion to uh, get away from the uh, thing right now so uh, nothing no breaking news fortunately uh i have been asked to speak about uh, how to counter uh, chinese um, misinformation disinformation uh, if i am not mistaken uh, just one minute uh, i just want to look at the exact countering china's information warfare is uh, what we are talking about now uh, of course it is uh, a job uh, that is not uh, exclusively uh, limited or reserved for the media uh countering the misinformation and disinformation we have heard uh, prasannan and we have heard shastri uh, speak about uh, various aspects of the chinese uh, propaganda machinery or or how to read uh, the chinese uh, media uh, so therefore i'm not going to get into that uh, i will uh, speak about my own experience in uh, dealing with china uh, particularly since uh, 2006 um uh, when i have been uh, traveling to china dealing with uh, the way the chinese uh, misinformation disinformation propaganda uh, plays out uh, and uh, of course uh, looking at uh, the uh, military uh, aspect of india china relationship or the boundary aspect of it uh, particularly from uh, what i learned in the northeast and then now in ladakh uh, my own sense about uh, the chinese uh, misinformation disinformation is that uh, it is something that is uh, gigantic and uh, no country uh, in the world uh, leave alone uh, uh, you know in, in india no country in the world alone can actually counter uh, the gigantic the mammoth machinery that china has built up over the years uh, to uh, propagate its own uh, ideology its own achievements and uh, disrupt uh, the um, the narrative uh, across the world it has to be a collective effort if uh, china is seen as uh, a threat uh, to uh, freedom and uh, you know the global uh, media uh, landscape uh, that uh, has worked uh, in the uh, favor of the west or the liberal democracies then uh, it needs to be a collective effort china has quietly uh, very silently uh, created a landscape that is uh, not easy to match uh, one because of its spread uh, across the world 
over 2000 bureaus uh, i'm just now talking only about the media outlets shinwa uh, cgtn uh, and then of course uh, the global times which is a much smaller and insignificant uh, part of the chinese uh, media narrative uh, if you have to get the official sense of the chinese um, policies then we have to uh, really look to shinwa uh, most probably um, rather than uh, global times global times is just a it's a hound dog uh, which uh, unfortunately too many people in india take uh, very seriously any opinion in global times is seen as uh, an official chinese position which i think is uh, something that we all must get over it uh, get over that obsession with global times we read it because it's easy to read in english uh, the real story or the real official position comes in shinwa and maybe uh, partly in uh, cgtn rather than uh, in uh, global times so first thing that we need to be very clear about how to counter the chinese narrative is to understand uh, the uh, pecking order uh, in the uh, the chinese uh, media and propaganda landscape global times does not figure in the far, uh, top 3 i would say it would be um, a travesty if we uh, made our policies and our judgments and our responses based on global times that's something that uh, we need to be aware of and i don't know whether shastri would um, you know uh, sort of uh, endorse that but uh, that's something that um, uh, i think he endorses that uh, but uh, the fact is uh, that we are obsessed with it how do you counter it now as i said it can't be a, a job for one country or one media outlet uh, to do uh, or counter the chinese propaganda uh, machinery or the chinese narrative that is built Uh, to do it it has to be uh, the one has to choose where to fight and how to fight it can't be across the board it can't be an omnipresent omnibus approach uh, to the chinese uh, media narrative or the propaganda narrative uh, what hurts the chinese is uh, the fact that uh, despite such a massive presence uh, such a uh, large presence in terms of um, the numbers as i mentioned in terms of bureaus across the world number of uh, chinese media personnel or media reporters working across the world uh, what hurts the chinese is that they're not taken seriously there's no credibility to it after all uh, media uh, sort of thrives on credibility uh, you can have a large presence you can have presence uh, all over in africa in europe in us but uh, when twitter or uh, any other uh, platform that is created by the west starts uh, branding uh, any of these uh, practitioners from china as china state affiliated media then uh, the credibility is completely demolished straight away you know at least in our eyes in uh, in the eyes of the media or uh, the think tank community or the strategic community in the non chinese uh, country or the non chinese uh, media landscape or think tank landscape straight away and i think uh, that is something that the chinese struggle uh, to gain that uh, nobody seems to be taking them seriously despite all the outpouring the large quantum of outpouring of writing and the rant and the uh, the kind of uh, statements that are made uh, and therefore uh, i think uh, the strategy should be to pick out uh, the important um, you know uh, think tanks in china and counter their narrative rather than countering global times so for instance the shanghai institute of strategic studies or uh, the uh, sikrir uh, which is there uh, which is mostly a uh, official uh, think tank for the foreign uh, ministry uh, must be taken seriously and uh, they must be countered on facts they must be countered on uh, their narrative rather than going all out to counter cgtn or try and build similar networks Uh, across the globe uh, which is uh, not possible given the kind of money and uh, uh, you know effort that is required in uh, doing that so that's number one we must also be aware that nothing in china uh, when it comes out of uh, these outlets like shinwa or cgtn or even global times or china daily or people's daily uh, will come out until uh, it has an official sanction or at least an official endorsement Uh, from uh, the chinese uh, communist party if not the government and therefore uh, you know one has to look at uh, each of those nuances and to do that uh, what i uh, recommend is and i'm going straight to the recommendations rather than you know trying to uh, 
uh, go beat around the bush is to uh, have more and more indians learning mandarin learning how to speak how to read uh, how to uh, uh, sort of get the nuances of the chinese language and uh, the chinese uh, way of making statements the chinese way of making statements is circumlocutory it is not uh, ever direct it will always uh, talk about history it will talk about century of humiliation it will talk about uh, friendship uh, even while they are making some statement if you look at just take the instance of the uh, boundary issue between india and china and uh, over the past 6 7 months for my own uh, websites and for my own uh, study i have been studying some of the old uh, statements from the 1950s and 60s chow and lai making a statement uh, if you look at their language it is like shastri said they are polite up front but uh, beneath that politeness is uh, the sense of purpose that they want to achieve single mindedly and uh, that's something that uh, we have not been able to uh, sort of uh, latch on to even if you have latched on to not too many people uh, actually uh, look at it uh, that seriously we we are uh, the people who look at it in black and white uh, we must understand that uh, the chinese like prasannan said i think uh, right at the beginning that uh, the chinese don't understand the way indian media or the indian intellectual uh, community uh, operates they just can't understand why uh, they have a point of view which is different from the indian government or from the indian official line and you can't make them understand because they've been brought up in an atmosphere in a in a in a framework which uh, they uh, they know they, they uh, know no other way really they only know what they see in their country and i'll give you a small anecdote in 2006 i was traveling to tibet on this newly uh, uh, created train fantastic uh, qtr railway the chinghai tibet railway going to lhasa from lanchao uh, just one month after it had started a fantastic feat of engineering marvel and uh, we were already i mean it was a, a chinese embassy sponsored trip with six other journalists i was the only one with uh, television cameras and um, uh, the uh, interpreter with us there were three interpreters but one young interpreter maybe about 26 27 years old fluent in english uh, influenced by uh, hollywood uh, and you know sort of uh, western ideas but of course a chinese uh, working for the foreign ministry so as we got a little familiar and uh, as we were on the train for 29 hours uh, our attention turned to uh, respective systems he was very curious about uh, how india functions how indian media functions uh, what what do we do for our livelihood as be as journalists all that so we kept uh, answering his uh, queries but um, then uh, one um, fine morning one of my colleagues uh, on the trip uh, a times of india journalist he uh, turned around and i thought he should uh, be a little mischievous so he asked lee he said lee uh, it's fantastic you know your country uh, infrastructure the kind of facilities look at this engineering marvel that we are traveling on uh, all that is there but you know there is a difference between what uh, india is and what uh, china is uh, so he said what is that so he says uh, in india we have a freedom of press we have a freedom to speak what we want even against the government you don't have that uh freedom of expression or freedom of press so for half a minute he was blank when that question was asked and he said uh, what is that so he just couldn't you know the uh, the generations uh, have been brought up on uh, a situation where they just don't know that anything can be spoken against the government or anything that you wish to speak uh, can be sp uh, spoken so you have to understand that we have two different systems and therefore Uh, unless we get into the minds of the chinese or uh, the chinese propaganda machinery we cannot counter it uh, but as i said there are vulnerabilities uh, they are very thin skin they uh, are still carry a um, uh, kind of a chip on their shoulder century of humiliation and they think they are like what i used to uh, what what i have compared it with some of my friends in the northeast having spent 23 years of my uh, early life in northeast uh, from 2000, from 1983 to 2006 um i know my friends in the northeast uh, the nagas the assamese the mizos all of them have a chip on their shoulder that rest of india is trying to conspire against them rest of india is neglecting them rest of india is not giving them what attention or not giving them what they want uh, from the uh, government of india or from the people of india 
and i used to always tell them that that please get over this uh, victim uh, mindset you know this persecution complex that you have i think the chinese in a larger way suffer from that complex they think the world is against them they think uh, the um, uh, i mean because of their own actions now of course they are forcing everyone to come together uh, but remember when we say that the americans are against the chinese it is the americans who opened the world to the chinese uh, in 1972 nixon and kissinger are responsible for that so today if we have to blame anybody we have to blame the americans who thought they can give uh, economic prosperity to uh, the chinese but they did not think that this uh, monster like napoleon had said don't um, uh, wake up uh, uh, don't wake up china because uh, it's a giant that will create problems for the world and today that uh, problem has come to bite the world but as i said the vulnerability is in countering uh, the chinese propaganda and misinformation and disinformation are uh, there uh, one of course that victims mentality that they have they still feel the entire world is against them and therefore they have to have that legitimacy which they are not gaining um, i'll give you a small example my own website uh, we uh, did uh, find some parallels in the rise of xi jinping and uh, hitler and we did a very factual uh, video Uh, a seven-minute video. If you haven't seen it, please see it. We called it Schindler, the rise of uh, Schindler, Xi Jinping and Hitler, and we actually uh, plotted each of the years and the in the parallels in their lives, in the way they have risen, uh, eliminating opponents, uh, grabbing power, becoming supreme leaders. Um, also, you know how uh, he sees who they saw themselves, all that. And when it went viral, uh, the Chinese embassy in Delhi. uh got to me call me and said that uh, this is unacceptable uh, this you shouldn't have done please delete the video immediately so um, you know just they just don't understand that why are they trying to tell me to uh, delete the video so i said deleting is not an option if you want to write something against it in protest you write to want to write a letter to me i will uh, willingly publish it Uh, so she said uh, the spokeswoman said that uh, no i will ask uh, my higher ups but that decision i cannot make but please delete it i said that option doesn't exist so later they sent me a note uh, i said you know i will take an unedited uh, letter from you i'll not edit it i'll take the full letter uh, but then they uh, sent me a message uh, through my colleague saying uh, there will be serious consequences if you don't delete uh, there will be a uh, very uh, big price for you to pay Uh, and i said okay go ahead uh, that is not a issue but they are so thin skinned about uh, many of these things so i pointed out to her that um, our own media writes uh, so many uh, derogatory or critical articles about our, our political leaders and uh, the, we don't sort of uh, go after them uh, like this but they are crude same thing happened with the uh, with the australian media in uh, in australia in sydney uh, they went against the abc so they just don't have the concept of a free media or an independent media and therefore uh, all that we have to do is to keep flooding uh, their uh, although there are firewalls there through vibo through um, wechat we should uh, keep flooding their um, you know the population with what's happening around the world uh, they don't get to know that uh, there are there is no one single way to counter the chinese propaganda because Uh, what the chinese have cleverly done is to erect a firewall and use the the very same platforms that the west or the liberal democracies in the west and uh, rest of the world have created with uh, instagram facebook they are using them to populate uh, their opinion or their uh, viewpoint uh, through these platforms so for instance let's take what happened in january earlier this year when the wuhan virus went viral uh the chinese uh, actually tweeted about uh, more than 90000 tweets on defending the uh, the chinese actions on the wuhan virus the official twitter handles of the chinese diplomats and think tankers and officials went up from uh, about 40 to 135 in less than a month and they tweeted some 90000 odd tweets across the globe uh, criticizing the us and then defending uh, the way they handled uh, the corona virus they of course uh, have in the military a strategic support force which looks after electronic warfare uh, cyber warfare psychological warfare they have a three legal three uh, warfare strategy legal uh, media and uh, of course uh, propaganda or psychological warfare and they are doing that 
so the world and i'm saying the world has to unite against that not just one country or one media entity uh, they also uh, get into uh, media houses big media houses with their deep pockets they buy space in uh, the large media publications like new york times or washington post in india number of newspapers carry uh, their supplements and carry uh, you know articles and uh, editorials or advertorials by the chinese embassy so that deep pockets cannot be matched by one entity it has to be a collective effort if liberal democracies want to counter uh, the chinese uh, deep inroads into all this and therefore uh, they have mastered the uh, non kinetic uh, contact warfare uh, in these uh, uh, by using these methods uh, they are hydra headed uh, as shastri has said but i am also not um, in agreement with you this is my point of disagreement with uh, shastri and uh, uh, i think uh, prasannan about um, the chinese media not being obsessed uh, with india i think the chinese media does get obsessed uh, with india uh, in fact uh, they uh, are now watching india much more and one point i want to make uh, which uh, again may be uh, open to contradiction is that the chinese have uh, had taken the eyes off of the ball when it came to india for the last 30 years their attention was about uh, uh, what to do with europe and with america and uh, now they do not have enough deep scholarship about china and that is now very reflective in the way they have miscalculated india's response on the border this time they did not think this robust response will come because they are now like we say that we do not have enough scholarship on china my sense is and i am uh, quite uh, happy to be contradicted with facts my sense is the chinese also have uh, very little scholarship on india the change india for 30 years they kept dealing with coalition governments after 1988 after 1991 let's say and they thought that is the way they can deal with uh, indian governments indian policy makers indian decision makers they miscalculated uh, the new reality where there is a majority government which is uh, which is uh, able to or is at least willing to stand up to china militarily uh, even if it comes at a high cost and this miscalculation is going to cost china very heavily because today they do not know how to get out of the kalde sack and i think this information warfare uh, has to be used uh, or this is this, this fact has to be used as a part of information warfare that today china is now uh, reiterating its 1959 claim a fictitious claim which india had never accepted uh, it's a contradictory uh, claim that they're doing but we have lapped it up uh, our media has lapped it up uh, we have, fortunately today if you see 24 hours later indian media is now quoting mea but we should have had more scholarship on china we should have more scholarship on china which unfortunately does not exist at least in the media uh, very little uh, attention is paid fortunately that is changing now we are uh, getting over our, our obsession with pakistan and uh, coming to china and paying more attention but we need more language expertise we need more china expertise and uh, the way to do it is to get taiwan get to taiwan or use taiwan's facilities and taiwan's uh, collaboration to understand the chinese mind we have to understand how the pla has changed from the earlier times i think scholarship so the one broad theme here i want to end with is that if we need to counter the chinese uh, propaganda or uh, chinese information warfare uh, then we need to understand the chinese and to understand the chinese we need to study the chinese to study the chinese we need to study mandarin we need to have more uh, people going to china and uh, trying to understand what's happening within china because china is a uh, monolith as far as the communist party of china is concerned but as a society it is not a monolith and uh, that is what we have to understand we see it from the lens of if we continue to see it from the lens of global times then i think we are completely uh, coming to wrong conclusions uh, as far as china is concerned i think that is what my uh, take away would be Uh, uh, to end uh, my presentation here, but I am open to be uh, contradicted, questioned, or even commented upon. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank, thanks, Nitin. That was a really superb uh, presentation on your part. I really enjoyed it. <coughs> And we have Mr. Satyamurthy on, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And it's about media and foreign policy. of course the three speakers before me have said enough and more on the subject by 
using China as an example. Basically, when it comes to media and uh, foreign policy, it's a multiple base street. See, only it's the two base street that uh, you have between the government and the media, and the media and the government, two between the media and the people, and through that the government. I will explain it. And then there is a question or an issue about your conscience and your commitment to the nation. Where do we draw the line? This has always been the case with most media persons, especially young and active or overactive. I will just recall the question of the 9 11 coverage in the US. That's it. I happen to be watching that uh, live TV coverage as it happened to be, as it happened. I saw everything happening in the first uh, attack. It was not covered. Even if you recall now, there is no footage of that because no one really expected it. What that happened, the entire media in was uh, the thing. You are landed there. They were covering everything when the second crash happened. I would assume that the first crash was an invite by the Al Qaeda for the local media to come to the spot before the second real big crash happened. That is beside the point. Basically, once the second event happened, and the local journalists under, uh, began suspecting that it was not an accident, but a sabotage or an act of terrorism. We have never seen the footage after that. Whatever we have seen over the last so many years, nearly 20 years, it's only the first few seconds or I mean few minutes that keeps repeating. So this is a question that we have to ask ourselves whether in terms of foreign and security policy, how far can we go or how far we should go? That many people are confused. Either they don't say anything, less it will be uh, impacting on the government's image at a very crucial time in the nation's history, or they say too much. This is one thing that uh, this way you have to. Uh, people covering the foreign policy have to be alive and aware of. Where do we and where do we? There cannot be any hard and fast rule, as I said about the 9 11 coverage. Each incident, each episode comes up with its own uh, problems, uh, op options. We have to decide on merits. This is becoming increasingly difficult, I would say, in the present day context, particularly for the print media journalists who have been brought up in a tradition. Today, now that we have got uh, electronic media competing with the print media, print media has begun competing with electronic media in turn. And there's a lot of jingoism, which is not based on facts most of the time. This is a problem for foreign policy making. And then there is always a question of this is one thing that, uh, particularly if there are students out there, I mean, the audience. If you are covering foreign policy or, say, for instance, in the Indian context, South Block, you have to be sensitive about building relationship and retaining them. You understanding one thing is one thing, your writing is another. Your writing is one thing, but understanding has to be honest. But as uh, speakers before me indicated, we keep talking, uh, writing uh, for a long time, say for about a week or two, or covering something on the way it has to be covered in national interest. We end up believing in that. We start believing in our own eyes, uh, believing in our own lies. With ourselves, we don't know to draw the line 
or to see the dear uh, actual friends. But there is an another element that uh, speakers before me also pointed out. The role the media can play in terms of foreign policy so the grassroots level. This I have to necessarily quote my personal experiences. In 2005 from Sri Lanka, I wrote that that is immediately after Mahindra Rajapaksa's election. Uh, I wrote in three years, this man is going to finish off LTT and on his terms. At that time, I did not even know him other than the fact that I had talked to a lot of people at the grassroots level and uh, or with uh, people on the street, academics and everyone. And I was looking for points that traditional journalists uh, may have missed. So once it got published, I uh, got a couple of calls from Delhi, friends in Delhi, asking me, what do you say? I said, it's going to happen. Then uh, with our help or without our help? That was the question that was asked of me. I said, with our help three years, without our help five years. Then I gave a long explanation. Then they, the response invariably from all the people who talked to me in the next three or four days is, we are conditioned to think within the box. So we require people who can think outside the box. Whether I was helping policy making or whether I was doing some non journalistic aspects of things is a different thing. But basically, the question is, we have to look for ground realities wherever we cover, particularly in other countries. Even inside India, when we are uh, covering Indian uh, decision making or perspectives, we have to see whether it will sell with the Indian population. If there is a view, we have to express it. That doesn't always happen. So, when some policy of our own government doesn't, this is about true of uh, even a domestic policy, not that's only foreign policy, doesn't sell with the masses, then we ask ourselves what happened. Because we didn't do our homework. See, the problem with most journalists, for that matter, uh, they have a 24-7 beat. It has not been made easy by the for the TV journalists and so the print journalists also. They never get enough time to think, reflect, and update their knowledge. And uh, lately, whenever there is war and this COVID condition, I am told that the journalists in the league get a yeah, press handout with, uh, from the uh, respective ministries. And that is all to it, because we see it in the next day by newspapers. Some of them may have changed the active voice in the statement to passive voice. The rest of it is only the same thing. And the question of going uh, and reporting from the field, as it happened during Kargil, is just not on right now, at least. Maybe if there is more action on the border, something more may happen. But basically, uh, the problem about foreign policy coverage for the media person is learning and learning more. That doesn't always happen. And here we have to be a great more careful than just writing about a domestic issue or a domestic policy or an event. Because you are going to be read elsewhere. <coughs> and if you have got a certain credibility, people will start believing you. You may be wrong. And in which case you should not shy away from correcting yourself. It happened to all of us. It should happen to all of us. And if it is early on in our career, we will, that much is better for us. We will at least know where the shoe pitches. Then uh, I'm not going to take much time. Maybe if there are questions I can take. Because it's all a combination of what others have already spoken. So, with the, and there is another thing, it's as a complaint as someone who covers Sri Lanka and Maldives for 20 years now. There's little coverage of India's foreign policy 
vis a vis our immediate smaller neighbors. Even now, though a lot is happening in terms of the India neighborhood first policy, how many of it you have read in your daily newspapers? We did not cover Operation Cactus enough in 1988 vis a vis Maldives. Then in 2014, India sent drinking water of all supplies to Maldives. We did not a single newspaper in India covered it either. Whereas for nearly 15 days, India was supplying drinking water of all things to the people of Maldives. That is a 150,000 population on a daily basis. That is all water, other three water, everything we supplied. Okay, there is also a problem then with the government agencies. The Navy and the Air Force did it. They did not take a media team, including that of Doordarshan. So how can you expect cooperation, uh, collaboration? And particularly in the case of smaller neighbors, we have to be very sensitive to the fact that the leader there counts. I would just a very senior dignitary from uh, Maldives came to Delhi when he was, uh, this is about, say, about uh, seven, uh, eight, eight years back. A lot of meetings were fixed for him in Delhi. Our senior people uh, participated, including his counterpart and uh, his uh, dad, person, Sage, etc. He was in Delhi for nearly five days. Not a single line appeared in any of the Indian newspapers. Then from Delhi, before leaving Satya, I have come here with a message of goodwill. And he was an official there. It's not, I mean, elected, he uh, was occupying an elected position. Not ton Indian newspapers have reported it. See, remember that he's going to carry this impression and what if he becomes the president of Maldives tomorrow and not that he was here doing any shopping anywhere he did transact business and i think i was the only one who covered that even it is for a think tank website the approach is totally different and the reach is much 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 less it's not done and again in the case Always be focusing on news of DRP rating kind of reportage. If it is some country, we have to talk, write only about it. If something else happens, no. See, for instance, India has been doing a lot of good things in Maldives in the last one and a half years. In the last 10 days itself, I will just uh, give India has started uh, building a $800 million uh, airport in the Northern Ireland. India started a ferry service that is uh, reached two days back, connecting Tutikorin, Cochin, a Northern Island called Kuldufushi and uh, Malay. It's a shipping corporation of India. They have got those going from uh, Kochi, uh, sorry, uh, Tutikorin. But this is a, a shipping corporation of India. Uh, this cargo ferry. Then, government of India announced in the last ten days, two hundred and fifty million dollars for their annual budget, as a grand note to strengthen the test. Before that, they, uh, India announced the construction of the sea bridge, six point seven kilometer long, which is which beats the uh, China built. Uh, sea bridge to the airport, which is only half this length, and, uh, and India is spending five hundred billion dollars on that. Other than that, because China was involved, we covered India, be China at a project in Maldives. None of the other things I said, we are covered. Yesterday, India has uh, supplied on Dornier aircraft, which have been aircraft for sea watching from the skies. And their purposes only is to look at smuggling, drug smuggling, etc., etc. And we may be interested in China watching also. 
but now the newspaper covers this this is likewise even in china as uh, people before me uh, said with the greater experience in china there is a people element there without understanding the people these are the people who are going to become leaders in that country they are going to go there only with the same mindset as we become our country's leaders with the more liberal mindset so how to read them or how to interpret them that's not a foreign uh, uh, media person i mean media person covering foreign policy has to understand educate himself and the media houses he works for he or she works for should also facilitate that process it is not always that you have to pick up a john offered by a foreign country go there have to write positive things in a conductor tour where you can't even slip out for a chat with the local it, it is true of every country it is not only really come to china or some other country any country you go your schedule is so tight you can't move anywhere so with that i close thank you mr satyamurthy that was a very interesting uh, narrative of yours so this is open to uh, you know all of you uh, but i think mostly to uh, you know shastri and nitin so one of the questions is <coughs> uh whether ccp pla and their agencies are engaged in disinformation misinformation strategies to contain internal dissensions uh, internal dissensions or issues if so how are they conducted and how effective are these methods can anyone if you uh, take it i think shastri would be the best person to take it yeah this is from kv thomas kv thomas has lot of questions but thomas we we only able to take a few of yours shastri yeah i can i yeah uh see, i i mean whether one wants to classify this as misinformation or disinformation uh my understanding is that we have to see that i think uh, nitin rightly dwelt on sinhua you know i had gone to the sinhua for an interview and they wanted me to work there were at that time 468 westerners there many of them who had lost their jobs and reuters bloomberg all of them had but with sinhua it has the best working hours very comfortable place international ambiance for working everything you get decent coffee you have separate kitchen halal food everything is there and but i told that guy that i don't want to be an editor who comes in for four and a half hours is there any way i can work in the office of the chief editor in chief or the ceo as an assistant or something to get an idea they said no we would never allow anybody in that circle you know so this is a completely closed thing now what but when i worked in global times for instance there was a prolonged campaign led by the us on the internet as uh, another right to fundamental right you know carried out by hillary clinton as secretary of state of the us and that time for instance i saw closely how like one there is a wall i basically used to handle copy rewrite or sharpen what they write or i would call it english making you know what i was doing what they wanted to say so one something one thing is they work very very hard you don't have any chinese editors who are passing around at parties in the evening these guys are working till 1 o'clock 2 o'clock 3 o'clock in the morning and they have a panel of experts whether it is economists scientists historians regional folk and they say no so and so is calling so and so he will send three paragraphs into it we'll put it together everything is then filtered through sinhua whenever it comes to foreign affairs like if the indian prime minister goes the statement might be released by uh, the office which person identified as the state council information office which is the information minister's office which incidentally the ministry of information and ministry of propaganda means the same thing in the chinese language so then sinhua kind of takes it and they will look at all the editorials that go whether it is in china daily whether it is in pla of course there are differences for instance now for this man who sejin the editor in chief of the global times who so much in the news to him even anand mahindra responded i remember there was an incident where he addressed all of us he said no we are not like china daily we will write what we want we are not bound this was during the time of hu jintao which was far more liberal than it is under xi jinping and some three four weeks after that word of this got out he was asked to call a meeting again and 
it was a typical party exercise where he was excoriated by other colleagues for what he said and he said yes when i said we will write what we will write he recanted a lot of what he said but was allowed to say this so the, the manufacturing goes on all the time you know in some sense a lot of it is presumed like i said i send a piece of writing it goes to a person what happens beyond that wall how many layers are there i don't think anybody has a clue to that but i would say as a journalist i don't have a clue either how the bjp's it cell works and what is the connection between the pmo and the it cell how they put out fake news and how it spreads in the media i think in a sense this is a very very complex operation we cannot kind of pinpoint exactly but i can say sinhua works on it they filter everything perhaps they have people from diverse department from intelligence agencies regional specialists they call language experts and they have experts in almost every indian language whereas we in india are so deeply prejudiced i don't mean the people in this community but once when i wrote about shiv shankar menon being fluent in mandarin and knowing the chinese nuances you know of behavior everything one of the letters written against the article was how can we trust the foreign secretary who speaks mandarin this is our outlook and in the recent situation we also found there was a clamor that we should ban the learning of chinese language but i think all these things don't help us to understand the secretive methods in which most government works when it involves state or security interest not the chinese alone i think i don't think they are better or worse than at it than anybody else that's my impression okay thanks yes, sir okay there's another uh, question from thomas i mean this is uh, sort of uh, uh, you know a supplementary question on he says do you think that disinformation or misinformation is a serious challenge to india's internal security even in the northeast where i was for more than one decade there there is only nominal impact of chinese propaganda in the recent past i think nitin was also talking something nitin, about the yeah, northeast nitin, yeah nitin mentioned about the northeast we work yeah. in the northeast yeah uh, so uh, can you can you answer that quickly nitin yeah uh, so no uh, minimal impact see misinformation disinformation now doesn't need to be area specific given the kind of uh, digital connectivity that we have it can work from anywhere uh, i mean uh, there are uh, bots and there are uh, chinese propaganda machines china doesn't have to really uh, specifically have to have a presence in uh, the northeast uh, but uh, what happens is uh, given the uh, the kind of uh, complex nature of uh, ethnic uh, and um, insurgency uh, differences that are there in the northeast it's difficult to uh, have one uh, campaign for the entire northeast to uh, be targeted by disinformation or misinformation it's a very complex region uh, with uh, more than 220 odd communities uh, who have their own aspirations their own politics so uh, even if china tries or if anybody tries it's difficult to actually influence uh, through uh, that, that kind of propaganda or that kind of misinformation so therefore i'm not so worried about uh what happens uh, in the northeast but what i'm worried about is the deep inroads that china has made across think tanks there is a beautiful uh, book written by um, clive hamilton an australian uh, academic uh, which talks about uh, the china chinese deep inroads into think tanks universities media not just uh, in the west but also in australia uh, indonesia singapore hong kong maybe Uh, even in india which we don't know that has not been studied enough uh, the deep inroads that the chinese have made i think we should be more worried about that rather than their propaganda and uh, otherwise i mean what happens is there are china apologists everywhere across the world i think that is something that we need, need to worry about can i can i just supplement what nitin has to say on that from my personal experience please the indian print media at least where i have been part of coverage on taiwan till many years ago was completely a strict no no which obviously meant editorial decision makers were under the chi under chinese influence otherwise why would they not allow coverage on taiwan so yeah. on uh, i'm looking at a uh, questions yeah uh, well we will skip the northeast because he's spoken about it so sanjeev kumar has a similar question so i think the yeah, he must have got the answer there i'm just uh, sort of reading out what commodore wasan had mentioned uh, whatever we do it would be foolhardy to expect that we can change the chinese 
which is ruled with an iron hand, whether it is learning Mandarin, whether engaging or countering the Chinese media or trying to challenge the system, I see nothing coming out of it. How can you even engage with them when they cannot even accept other systems like democracies and say that they are successful? Democracies are successful. That's one point he's made. And then he goes on to say, any engagements and even being accommodative to China's sensitivities has been counterproductive. So in this environment, how can the media play a constructive role at all? Flooding the Chinese is increasingly difficult technically with AI, artificial intelligence, with even more restrictions. I think we need to be realistic in our assessment of the efficacy of the measures suggested by Nitin. Nitin, what's uh, Shashi, uh, before you uh, switch on to the next subject, can I have a, a few words, please? Sure. Yeah, you know, uh, we have uh, spoken about the so-called Chinese invincible uh, machine. We feel that the Chinese have bitten much more than they can chew. <clears throat> but uh, what I would like to say as a practitioner of disinformation or misinformation, um, there have been some specific areas of achievements by the Indian media, <clears throat> especially with the growth of the uh, Indian uh, private sector media, there has been some tremendous, uh, you know, uh, propaganda that we have carried out. I think Nitin will bear me out in 2008 when the Chinese were creating problems for us in Ladakh. Uh, the Indian media went at them, went at them with uh, hammer and tongs. There was never a day that the Chinese were not uh, bombarded by the media from Delhi or wherever. I think, and not only this, we have had some substantial success in trying to portray our viewpoints across in a very deliberate and in a very you know, asymmetrical manner. We have the capacity, we have the knowledge. I think we only need to believe ourselves. Like everybody has said, Ranari has said yesterday, and we have been shared by some of our colleagues, that unless you do not understand the country which is your target, understand the language it speaks, and understand its nuances, you will not be able to share a weapon. I think even today, if we are in a position to uh, take on uh, a particular task, it can be done, it is not impossible, but it takes two hands to clap. The government cannot be alone in this. I think like what our colleagues in the cybersecurity session said, it has to be a partnership if you want to take on this giant. And I think we are not very far. And what this uh, particular, uh, uh, standoff in uh, Ladakh has shown us that if we get our act together and if the media mounts a high vo voluble campaign, the message goes to not only the Chinese, but anywhere else, people who are watching us. For example, uh, look at ASEAN countries, they're looking at us. Today, we stand firm in Ladakh, 60% of the ASEAN countries will turn towards us. We will have a lot of support coming in. So I think. Uh, information warfare, disinformation, it's not yesterday, it's been going on for hundreds of years. It is just that we are focusing on this now. I think to this platform, it is good to fashion some more responses to it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Evelika. Well said. Uh, you mentioned Ladakh. So there's a question uh, uh, from Sundarajan Murari, who's a senior journalist here in Chennai. So he has a question. Shashi, uh, there was this Mr. Uh, Komodo Vasan's uh, thing. Uh, about yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, please. Yeah, I just want to uh, just uh, respond very briefly. Yeah. I'm not for, for a moment saying that we want to um, destroy or uh, disintegrate or uh, you know weaken China in any way. What I'm saying by, when I say that we need to study uh, the Mandarin language, uh, the Chinese society, the nuances, and the Chinese, uh, you know, that uh, sort of we must disabuse ourselves of the fact that it's a monolithic society. Uh, it, the party may be monolithic. The party, after all, uh, this is the uh, communist dynasty that is ruling China. Uh, if there were Ming dynasty earlier, this is the uh, CCP dynasty that is ruling China. In my view, PLA is the uh, the uh, militia of the Chinese Communist Party rather than a professional army or a military uh, because they do the bidding of the Chinese Communist Party and not the Chinese people really. It, it's not a people's army anymore. It's the Communist Party's army. That said, uh, if we don't understand, if we don't know your adversary, how do we engage with them? How do we do uh, our counter narrative or our counter uh, strategies? Is all the, that uh, the point that I was trying to make? Because otherwise, we are very poor in uh, understanding China precisely because we haven't paid enough attention to China. We paid uh, over 
um, uh, you know, obsessively uh, overreacted to um, a tiny country like Pakistan and uh, continued to be obsessed with it. Fortunately, that is changing now. We have reoriented ourselves to China. And I think, uh, like Mr. Heblicker said, it's not too far away. Uh, we will get there. We have done some of it. Uh, if you look at my own website, in this last seven, eight months, I, I say this, uh, and I, I'm not making any uh, secret of it, that uh, the uh, Chinese uh, virus and the Chinese standoff has helped me uh, gain traction uh, on the website that I have. If you look at the, the coverage that we are doing, and very factual coverage, it's not uh, something uh, over the top, it's not jingoistic, but we are getting different experts to speak. We are uh, bringing out historical facts. We are bringing out China's perfidy, uh, record of China's perfidy and China's uh, duplicity. All that we are bringing out with facts and figures and uh, documents. So I think it can be done. It needs a very focused attention to it. That's all I was trying to say. Yeah. Shastri? Yeah. yeah. I wanted to come in here and amplify this point, which would also respond in part. A very small part to the question Commodore Vasan has raised. I, I'm wholly in agreement with Nitin that if you are dealing, you have to know the nature of the beast. You know, you have to know what China represents. As he has said more than once, the party is a monolith. China is not a monolith. I have traveled to several provinces. I still do not understand the Chinese. And I have met two South Asian ambassadors in Delhi, not the Indian one. And this man said, I am in Beijing only for one or two days every month. Otherwise, he says, I am traveling from province after province, and I might not be able to complete it in five years. I have not come across an Indian diplomat do that. But I have come across young Indian IFS probationers who had taken a cycle and going around every part of China. There are a hundred Chandni Chowks in Beijing. They go to every gully. They eat every kind of food. And they are trying to get a grasp of that culture. You know? So I think it, this is one aspect. One is Beijing. Then just like you have regional differences in India, the way people speak, dress, talk, and eat, there are so many such regional differences in China. What the people of Sichuan think of that. I mean, the people of, for instance, Yunnan would deal with us differently than the bureaucracy in Beijing. So I think we can make inroads into society. That Chinese people are not hostile to the Indian people. This is the first thing we must recognize. This is a conflict of the states, of their interests, or of the government. This is not a conflict between people of the two countries. Second, if we say they don't understand our democracy, how can we deal with them? Whatever we do, they will not change. That proposition uh, advanced by Commodore Vasan has no historical basis. It is totally ahistorical to take such a position. Because let us look at 1971. I'm no supporter of Indira Gandhi politically, the way she scrunched political face at home. But 1971, apart from being India's finest military art, was also India's greatest hour of international diplomacy. Let us not forget that. And which were the countries? The countries which speak our language, which talk in our language to sell us their weapons. None of them supported India. Not Britain, not US, not Western Europe, not France, none of them. In fact, the United States, and Kissinger admits in his book, that they were trying to nudge China to attack India from the east when we were having this war with Pakistan. The one country which supported us is Russia. And it is because of Russian support and the way it was coordinated. We, we don't speak Russian. They don't understand democracy. For that reason, do we say you don't deal with Russia? I find this is a way to kind of build a wall of hostility. And then similarly, Indira Gandhi, most of Indian public sector projects through the 70s and 80s, they carried out huge projects in Africa, in the Arab world, Libya, Jordan, Iraq, all these places. The Arabs don't know democracy. They don't understand. For that reason, we reject them. No, I think the language of diplomacy is not necessarily the ethnic linguistic language that we call language. I think there are many languages in which one can communicate as a diplomacy. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Shastri. There's uh, this question from Mr. Murari. Uh, who's a journalist who says, uh, I mean, he refers to Ladakh, which Mr. Heblika was referring to. He talks about the Chinese build up there and uh, he says the tension may last through the winter into the next year, etc. So his basic point is, is it a psychological war? Is it a psychological war? Nitin or Shastri? Yeah, 
should i yes please okay no it's a, it's a war of uh, all domains it's uh, it's a five dimensional war it's a war of uh, land uh, sea uh, although it's far away from ladakh but um, it's land uh, sea space uh, air and uh, what i call information warfare space china uh, did that during doklam in uh, 2017 they unleashed uh, the entire fury of uh, their think tanks and newspapers and articles and all that uh, talking and uh, reminding india of the humiliation in 1962 uh, but eventually had to agree to a compromise and go back uh, this time uh, the uh, rhetoric is uh, uh, toned down but it is there i mean you, you still get that in uh, some of the uh, articles and some of the uh, things in mandarin that are happening from the think tanks that they keep talking about what happened in 62 and why india cannot win the war with china so it's all psychological it is legal it is uh, they talk about when i say legal uh, look at the way they have claimed the so called 1959 line there's a huge contradiction in what they are saying there was no agreed upon 1959 line india has never accepted any line uh, along the lac uh, and china has never accepted a line also and yet they say that uh, they will abide by the 7 november 1959 line so it's a legal warfare it's a media warfare it's a psychological warfare and it's a kinetic warfare so it's nothing that we should uh, ignore everything has to be taken into account yeah thanks nitin uh there's one question that two people have put it's similar it's again uh, you know uh, addressed to you nitin it says how is russia viewed in china and uh, how does china view the quad i think the chinese are quite uh, worried about the quad in fact uh, one of the reasons why they are now uh, talking uh, or sort of coming back to the negotiating table or at least making an opening gambit uh, on uh, saying that we'll abide by the 7 november 1959 line uh, and also talking about uh, how only diplomacy can solve it is also because uh, they have pushed india and other countries into a, a much closer cooperation uh, in terms of quad and other otherwise so the quad uh, ministers uh, speaking uh, or meeting on 6th of october uh, has them worried because quad after all is uh, a major part of the indo pacific um, uh, construct which the chinese are worried about uh, because malacca is there and there are uh, dilemmas that they face in terms of uh, the uh, maritime connectivity secondly how is russia seen in china well uh, i think china is using russia for its um, uh, defense technology if it uh, whatever they can give, uh, give and which can be reverse engineered but russia is also playing a very balancing kind of a role uh, in fact we just did a small uh, piece yesterday not a small piece but a, a detailed piece on how russia is playing a balancing role between india and china uh, in uh, the current context Russians cannot be counted out because Russians have been old Indian uh, friends of India, and uh, they have uh, some wherewithal which we can do with, and um, therefore uh, even they facilitated the uh, bilateral meetings of the defence ministers and then the foreign ministers. So they are very much in the equation. They are the Chinese see them as uh, weak power right now, uh, but also important to uh, keep a strike a balance with uh, as a balancer. Uh, with uh, its fight against us and uh, partly with india i think that is the way russian is doing it i'll end with this this is uh, from sanjay tambat and he says there is speculation about internal dissent and this is and dis and dissatisfaction among the chinese people how has the party and state been able to suppress and control such a huge population for such a long time is it the educational system there or is it through indoctrination how has media been used to establish and maintain this hegemony we end with this kasri i think i <laughs> suppose uh, that the media is seen as a part of the party's armory for political management and uh, it cannot be separated i suppose there is dissent in all places even if we look at there is uh, uh, let us say our external affairs minister and the chief of defense staff are speaking in different uh, tones about how to deal with china so there are differences across but i i don't think that there as is much of a difference as anything is going to collapse or that will what shall i say blunt the focus of the chinese objective when it is dealing 
with a situation like it is vis a vis India now. So I think when we look at any dissent and things like that, we have to see it from that context. Whether it is in any way going to affect their single mindedness of purpose, or is it going to subserve our interest? Are these sections that are dissenting those which we or any Western agencies can reach out to? No, the answer is no. And I don't think India has been able to stand up when it was called to. For instance, when there was a conference in India on Tibet and Xinjiang and everything. First, the government of India issues the visa. Having issued the visa, it should have stood its ground. But then it buckled and it cancelled the visa. So I don't think that way India stands up to this whenever there is an opportunity to assert its presence in a democratic space. First, The second thing is the party's management and control is getting worse day by day. There is no doubt about that. It is becoming more illiberal. And there are similarities to this even in democracies. For instance, this whole campaign against corruption. A campaign against corruption, we all know, is two-sided. It can also be used to pick off your opponents, to put them behind bars. And this is also being done. The second thing is that, unlike Hu Jintao, Xi Jinping visited media officers, especially CCTV. And he made it clear that there should be unquestionable loyalty to the Communist Party of India, to the Communist Party of uh, China. When he says something like that, he goes to the newsroom and he tells people, then that means this is the end of the kind of uh, the relaxations or the little indulgences that were allowed to you as media. That is no longer the case. What this has resulted in, which I have seen, is that all organizations have party units within the organization. In many places, more people are joining the party units within the organization because they feel that will affect their career. Otherwise, in 2009 and 10, in global times, I found there were more employees who were not part of the party unit in the English global times. But in China International Publishing Group, under Xi Jinping, more of them are part of the party unit. So I think it drives people to seek safety and security under these various awnings that the state puts up. So this is the way of management that you manage through these committees in these organizations. The government doesn't have to literally come with a heavy hand and say, no, write this and stand behind your neck and breathe it. They have their people. They know what is expected of them. And they, these are the, what you call the sappers and miners, the foot soldiers, you know, in every department, in every organization of the party. Shashi, just one small point uh, on this. I mean, I'm sure this audience knows, but it's still worth uh, repeating that even the PLA, every PLA formation has a political commissar. He has the last word. Yes. Let's not forget that. Yes. Uh, you know, it's a different uh, army from any other professional army. That the uh, decision is a, a political, uh, political decision. decision. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, uh, we have to be uh, aware that it, the party is omnipresent. Uh, it has uh, watchers, it has uh, minders, it has uh, people who keep a watch on any kind of a dissent. So the China is not collapsing. Like I keep telling my friend Gordon Chang, you were wrong in 2012, you're wrong now. Coming collapse of China, he wrote that book. Uh, but it hasn't happened. It's not happening in a hurry. At least uh, I don't see it happening in the next uh, 10 to 15 years unless there's a massive, massive unrest that happens. But I, I, I'll be happy to be proved wrong on that, of course. Yeah, Astri and uh, Nitin and uh, Prasannan, who is not here, and Mr. Satyamurthy. I think it's been an excellent uh, discussion. I talked to a friend of mine who spent over two decades in China yesterday. Our uh, speakers brought out today. So uh, I just want, since I didn't make any, I forgot to make my introductory remarks. I just want to put in my uh, two bit here. And say there are over 2,200 newspapers in China, all state run. And there are about uh, 7,000, over 7,000 uh, magazines and journals in China. And uh, there, uh, there are about 940 million netizens in China or internet users. So, on that uh, note, I think we need to end this very uh, illuminating discussion. Thank you, everybody, for your participation and enriching everyone. Thanks.